This is wrestling's greatest moments. Hey now, wrestling fans. Wrestling fans have many fond memories of the lovable losers who counted the lights for their opponents every week in the WWF. However, we couldn't cover them all in one video, so here are 10 more for your viewing pleasure. Sit back as Wrestling's Greatest Moments looks at 10 more legendary WWF jobbers from the 1980s. Before we get started though, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a single video. Whether you call them jobbers, preliminary wrestlers, or enhancement talent, these wrestlers weren't in it to win it, but to make their opponents look like a million bucks and give wrestling fans an idea of what a superstar could do in the ring. As discussed last time, jobbers came from various backgrounds. Some were former greats whose stars had fallen with age. Others were up-and-coming performers looking to make a name for themselves. Others were capable wrestlers who lacked the look, opportunity, or X-factor that made their colleagues into stars. Whatever the case, these wrestlers served a vital role in wrestling, and their contributions should never be ignored or understated. This time around, we'll be looking at 10 jobbers who had successful careers either elsewhere or in the WWF or WWWF, but whose careers began to lose a step as they began counting the lights on a regular basis. And don't worry if you don't see your favorite job guy on our list, there will be more videos to come, including one looking at enhancement talent outside the WWF. Johnny Rods Whether counting the lights for opponents and making them look like the next big thing or training wrestlers to become the next big thing, Johnny Rods performed his roles with precision. The man nicknamed Unpredictable was anything but in the ring, where he could be counted on night after night to entertain the fans. Rods competed in the WWWF and WWF from the 1960s through the 1980s, a sign of how much he brought to the promotion. While Rods didn't hold any gold in the WWF, he held several titles in the World Wrestling Council as the Medic No. 2 and Super Medic No. 2. Rods' skills were regarded enough that he was invited to wrestle in All Japan Pro Wrestling on at least two tours. He also competed as Arabian Wildman Java Rook in NWA Hollywood Wrestling, holding the International Heavyweight Championship in Montreal's International Wrestling. According to Rods, he was the first wrestler Roddy Piper managed. While Rod's wrestling career stands out, his time training aspiring wrestlers is even more impressive. Operating out of the famous facility Gleason's Gym, Johnny trained students including Taz, Vito, Matt Stryker, Tommy Dreamer, and the Dudley Boys brother Devon. Rod's was inducted into the WWF Hall of Fame in 1996 in recognition of his decades of work in the company. Coco Beware Pile Driver Coco Beware's catchy entrance theme, which Coco sang the vocals on, but a song eventually replaced by Do the Bird, was just a part of a captivating act that included colorful ring attire, his exotic macaw Frankie, and most of all, a dynamic style that incorporated the high-flying style that was just beginning to become prevalent in the WWF. Coco was a successful act in Memphis's Continental Wrestling Association, or CWA, particularly in tag team action, where he worked as Sweet Brown Sugar, Stagger Lee, and Coco Ware. He formed championship tag teams there with stars including Bobby Eaton and Norvell Austin. Coco and Norvell's team, The Pretty Young Things, attracted attention outside Memphis in the after magazines. Coco adopted the name Coco Beware during a short run in Bill Watts' Mid-South Wrestling before coming to the WWF. Coco got a modest push and used the Brain Buster, dubbed the Ghost Buster as his finisher, defeating Jobber after Jobber. However, Coco soon settled into the role of Jobber to the Stars. That didn't stop Coco from getting high-profile gigs on Saturday night's main event, including a win over Nikolai Volkov or pay-per-view appearances. Coco was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in 2009. Rene Goulet with a career dating back to the 1950s, Rene Goulet was a seasoned veteran by the time he captured the WWWF Tag Team Championship alongside Carl Gotch in 1972. The 60s and 70s were prosperous for Goulet in terms of titles, as he held championship gold in the NWA Pacific Northwest, Championship Wrestling from Florida, and Georgia Championship Wrestling. In addition, he also worked as Sergeant Jacques Goulet. WWF fans who saw Rene in his later years usually saw him putting over talent, often wearing a sequined white glove that made him stand out, and some fans wonder if he was emulating pop sensation Michael Jackson, not to be confused with jobber Mike Jackson.
A skilled worker, he could always be called upon to make opponents look great, and Rene helped many wrestlers early on in their careers to get them used to the challenge of the squared circle. One such wrestler was Nature Boy Ric Flair, who recalls, Rene Goulet really took care of me when I was a young guy breaking into the business. Not only did I work with Rene and he took the time to teach me, we became very close friends. He was also a damn good worker. Rene stepped away from full-time competition in 1986, working a Legends Battle Royal in 1987. Goulet became a road agent, and fans who never saw him compete may remember him as one of the WWF officials who struggled to free the Ultimate Warrior from the coffin The Undertaker locked him in. Swede Hansen Big, rugged, and tough, Swede Hansen made it easy for fans to believe he was not a man to be trifled with. Hansen began working in the WWF in 1958 when it was still known as Capital Wrestling. From there, Hansen and Rip Hawk formed a successful heel team that won various tag team titles in the 60s and 70s. The Big Swede worked in the WWF off and on, with campaigns throughout many NWA territories. In 1979, Hansen returned to the WWF, with classy Freddie Blassie managing him to dominant wins over enhancement talent and occasional wins over higher-ranked wrestlers such as Chief J. Strongbow and Ted DiBiase. Hansen earned several WWF championship matches against Bob Backlund in 1979 and 1980, but couldn't get the win. Backlund wasn't the only opponent Hansen couldn't beat, as by the tail end of 1979, he was a jobber to the stars. Hansen returned to the WWF in 1982, and while he earned occasional shots at the Intercontinental Championship and even a WWF Tag Team Championship bout, he was firmly entrenched at the top of the WWF's job squad. Hansen's redneck gimmick, where he carried a Confederate flag into the ring, was just one of the many things that distinguished him from other jobbers. The biggest was Hansen's size, as he didn't look like a wrestler accustomed to counting the lights. Hansen sometimes competed in battle royals, including a steel cage battle royal, and occasionally donned an official shirt to serve as a special referee. Sweet Hansen retired in 1985. Tony Gurria While some fans might feel Tony Gurria went from hero to zero, Tony, as we noted in our video, wrestlers considered for the WWF Championship, was reportedly considered as a potential WWF Champion following superstar Billy Graham's title reign. Whether or not this was the case, Tony had a wildly successful run in the WWF and WWF as Tag Team Champion, winning the belts five times with four different partners. Fans who watched wrestling at this time know that Tag Team Champions often worked singles matches, including title bouts, and were considered formidable opponents. Even after Gurria's last run as Tag Team Champion, he was still booked as someone who could give wrestlers a run for their money, clearly falling into the Jobber to the Stars category. Gurria hung up the tights in 1986, but became a road agent for the WWF, and he appeared in several angles where WWF officials were called upon to break up a brawl or nefarious attack on a wrestler. George Wells George Wells was one of many pro football players to become pro wrestlers. In Wells' case, he played in the Canadian Football League for several seasons, including one where he and his teammates on the Hamilton Tiger Cats won the league's top prize, the Grey Cup. Wells began competing in the WWF in 1984. He was one of many regional stars that the WWF hired to expand its roster, give fans from other territories a familiar face, and deplete rival promotions of their wrestlers. George Wells was a champion in several territories such as Mid-Atlantic, Championship Wrestling, Calgary Stampede Wrestling, and Central States Wrestling. His limited charisma likely kept him from moving into the mid-card, but he had the look and ring abilities to plausibly present a challenge to higher-ranked opponents. Wells' run in the WWF is often remembered for his WrestleMania II loss to Jake the Snake Roberts, where he foamed at the mouth after Roberts placed Damien on him. Wells left the WWF in 1986 and worked in several territories before retiring in 1988. Salvatore Belomo our pal Sal was born in Belgium, but that didn't stop him from playing Italian or Italian-American wrestlers, and why not? Salvatore was of Italian descent, despite his Belgian background. Belomo began wrestling in the 1970s, when promoters often featured wrestlers of different ethnicities as babyfaces to appeal to fans. According to a 2019 article on Salvatore, the WWF brought him in because the promotion needed a new Italian hero to carry on in the tradition of Bruno Sammartino. Although Belomo ended up largely working as an enhancement talent, he was another jobber to the stars. He also appeared on the WWF's talk show Tuesday Night Titans more than once. 
On one occasion, Belomo showed how to build a model ship out of copies of WWF magazine. Another time, Salvatore provided a cooking class in a segment titled, That's a My Kitchen. Tiger Chung Lee WWF fans know him as Tiger Chung Lee, but outside the WWF, he was usually known as Kim Duke, who competed in Japan and North America, winning a few championships along the way. Duke entered the WWF in 1983 as Tiger Chung Lee, a fearsome martial arts practitioner. Tiger Chung Lee teamed up with Mr. Fuji, and the dastardly duo earned several shots at the WWF Tag Team Championship. Unfortunately, Lee proved to be a less capable partner than Fuji's championship partner, Mr. Saito. Along the way, Tiger Chung Lee worked less than a handful of title matches against Bob Backlund and an Intercontinental Championship match here or there. While he wasn't losing to top talent, Tiger Chung Lee usually clobbered everyone in the preliminary ranks, making him a true jobber to the stars. Tiger Chung Lee left the WWF in 1988, and by then, he had sunk to mere jobber status. Leaping Lanny Poffo Lanny Poffo is in the rarefied air of enhancement talent who had his own gimmick and is remembered just as much for his persona as for his close but no cigar performances against various WWF superstars. Like many enhancement talents, Poffo was a solid worker and frankly he was better than many of his opponents. Lanny, the son of territory star Angelo Poffo and the brother of Macho Man Randy Savage, honed his skills in several territories, holding single and tag team championships. Poffo's combination of mat wrestling and aerial maneuvers, such as the moonsault, made him stand out from nearly every WWF superstar working in the 80s. Leaping Lanny formed a strong bond with the fans and entertained them before each match by reading a poem. Poffo then threw frisbees into the audience as souvenirs. Poffo's babyface act made for some excellent matches, even as he lost once he stepped out of the preliminary ranks. Leaping Lanny's personality made him a natural for the WWF's entertainment-heavy Saturday Night's main event specials, and he appeared on several episodes. Poffo could generate sympathy from the audience, and during an episode of Saturday Night's main event leading to WrestleMania 3, Poffo did a stretcher job after Andre the Giant headbutted him during a battle royal. Poffo always did his best to stand out without stealing the spotlight. For example, he participated in Come As You Are, Anything Goes Battle Royals in the WWF while wearing a suit of armor. Poffo's WWF career received a push when he aligned himself with Mr. Perfect. Poffo's 1989 transformation into his heel persona The Genius elevated him briefly, including an upset countout win over Hulk Hogan on the November 5th, 1989 Saturday Night's main event. Quick Draw McGraw did Rowdy Roddy Piper beat Rick Quick Draw McGraw so badly that McGraw died? This urban legend sprang up after McGraw, a short but powerfully built wrestler, challenged Piper to a TV match. McGraw appeared on Piper's pit, blasting the Rowdy Scott for talking a good game but never competing in TV matches. McGraw got his wish and a professional grade beating in the ring that led to the official stopping the bout. Tragically, the TV match aired right around the time Rick McGraw died, leaving some fans to believe he'd been beaten to death. While this match has overshadowed Rick McGraw's career, he enjoyed modest success in the territories, including his heel team, the New York Dolls, with The Dream Machine. Rick McGraw was another wrestler who enjoyed success in territories outside the WWF and whose skills and name recognition made him another talent worth poaching. He was used in other angles, including one where monster heel Killer Khan broke his neck. Rick McGraw was only 30 when he passed away from a heart attack. Iron Mike Sharp Wrestling's Greatest Moments received so many requests for Canada's Greatest Athlete that we've made an entire video just for Iron Mike. Be sure to check it out! Do you remember these wrestlers who weren't short on talent but inevitably came up short in the ring? Do you miss the days of jobbers and jobbers to the stars? Who are your favorites? Share your thoughts in the comments section and let us know if there are any videos you'd like Wrestling's Greatest Moments to cover. In the meantime, subscribe to our channel, follow us on X and Instagram, and spread the good news about Wrestling's Greatest Moments, the channel that celebrates the squared circle.